call to order the public hearing on House Bill 636. And for committee information, this bill has been before the committee a number of years ago. Uh, it's been studied, uh, it has been, and last year was here. It was greatly shortened this year, but still is a complicated area that uh, will, I believe, replace two statutes. I have asked our committee assistant to bring down to you copies of both of those statutes so you can, uh, at your leisure, see how the, what difference there is. Um, since this is a complicated issue and probably will need some work, and we're not going to have it be able to resolve it between uh, in the, really the day and a half we have to do all the exact, considering the other bills, what I'd like to do is set up a subcommittee, and the subcommittee is not going to have any more time to work, directly even less. So it, I would hope that the committee would agree to retain this bill and have a subcommittee work on it uh, and uh, come up with a recommendation, probably it will be next October, it's coming October, so it can go into the House in January. Any questions? Ah, yes. We have a fair number of cards. Um, and if I am correct, a great number of them will be repetitive in nature. I would like to have this completed in one hour's time. Um, you can sign the blue card as the gentleman is the blue sheet indicating if you're for or against and that you don't want to speak. So I ask your consideration because if I add up all the time here, it's well actually when someone says two minutes, I multiply that by four. Um, <laughs> all right. Representative McGuire, you're the prime sponsor. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dan McGuire. I represent the towns of Epsom and Pittsfield in Merrimack County. This bill is a, as the chairman said, is a comprehensive uh, rewrite of our asset, state asset forfeiture law. Asset forfeiture is the way that we separate criminals from the means that they use to commit their crimes and the ill-gotten gains of their crimes. The problem with our current law is that on occasion, the, the, the people caught up in it are not necessarily criminals. They may not have had a criminal conviction. And also, the motives um, of law enforcement may not be necessarily pure when the results of the forfeiture are used to fund their departments. So um, this bill has three main goals. Uh, the first goal is to require a criminal conviction first before forfeiture takes place. It also protects innocent property owners. So if the criminal uses their employer's place of business, their spouse's car, their mother's <coughs> apartment to conduct their, their crime, those, and those innocent owners don't know what's going on, they're protected from, from forfeiture. And secondly, and lastly, it, it um, removes the incentive for overzealous or unbalanced policing by putting the proceeds of forfeiture into the general fund um, and not as sort of extra funds for law enforcement. Um, what this bill does not do is that it does not in, in interfere with the police in any way in terms of how they go about their operations, how they conduct seizures and so on. All that is the same. This is only about what happens to property in court. Um, and the second thing it does not do is that there are, there are also federal forfeiture laws, which you may have heard about in the press a lot recently. This does not interfere or affect the operation of federal law. This is strictly about our own state law and how to improve it. I've given you three pieces of paper. Uh, the first one is just my remarks. The second one is a side-by-side -side comparison of the current law and this proposed law. And the third is an extremely minor amendment that I would suggest um, go with the bill. Most of it is just 
putting in the word the or and or something. There's one particular, the reason I, I did put the amendment in though was one particular section dealt with the treasurer receiving property for forfeiture and, and we had forgotten that the treasurer complained that they have no way of, of uh, putting property up for auction or any of that stuff. So this fixes that, uh, that section of the bill and I'm happy to answer questions. And passing out to the community member copies of the criminal law. Are there any questions for Representative McGuire? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Representative One of the problems that we identified last time around was by requiring a conviction prior to the asset forfeiture that left open a long space of time for these assets to somehow disappear and evaporate. That was the problem. Uh, how does this bill solve that problem? Um, yes, thank you for the question. The, the, as I said, this is not about seizure. So police can still, just as they would today, seize uh, items or cash or whatever right when they are when they see them and when the crime occurs and they would take charge of them just as they do today this is only about at the end of the day how the court orders the property either to be forfeited or returned or whatever um thank you for the question i guess Maybe um, I'll uh, wait for an attorney to, to answer that that level of detail. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. Chair. And Thank you, Representative. I, I have a ton of questions, but this is probably not the time to do it. But in in reference to the testimony you just gave, that this is all court stuff occurring later, my reading of the bill indicates that a claimant pre-trial and pre-court proceedings even uh, can litigate uh, the right of possession of property by motion. Uh, what if the investigation is still going on and I'm a claimant or I'm a defendant, a putative suspect let's say, and I'd like to know more about that investigation that's still ongoing, so I'm going to go file a uh, pre-trial replevin hearing, and I'm going to find out everything I can about an ongoing investigation. Is that your intent here? Um, again, I would say that's a level of detail that maybe I can uh, I can uh, leave for others who are more um, more knowledgeable of that. that Thank you. Kind of thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative, for taking the question. <clears throat> if you cannot seize property until there's a conviction, does that person have the ability to sell his property in the meantime? Uh, thank you for the question. Again, it's not, you can't seize property before a conviction. You can't forfeit property. Property can be seized right away. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is, if it's real property, maybe title would would be uh, encumbered in some way. Um, but this is about the end of the day, not the first day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have uh, Chief Justice uh, Nato here. Um, who's going to provide us with information. Uh, she's not taking a position one way or the other. Thank you. Um, do you have a copy of the amendment? I do. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, members of the committee and Mr. Chairman. My name is Tina Neto. I'm the Superior Court Chief Justice. And I'm here to tell you, to testify because I know that I testified in the past against this legislation because it was very cumbersome and uh, complicated and I was concerned about the effect on the court system. So I am not taking a position on this bill because I, I think that Representative McGuire has done a lot of work to respond to some of the concerns of folks in the past couple of sessions and it's really been changed and improved and streamlined so I think um, it's important for me to tell you that I'm not objecting, I'm not taking a position, I'll let leave that policy matter up to the legislature. I, I'm happy to hear that you know, the committee is considering retaining the bill because there are some drafting concerns 
that I find confusing and maybe uh, they can be explained or adjusted if there's subcommittee work. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. On page two, line, uh, page two, line 14, it's unclear what substitute or unreachable property is. There's no definition. Uh, it might be that this provision is intended to function much like a fraudulent transfer. That's when a defendant tries to, before the arrest, get rid of property because they're worried about a pending arrest. Um, and put them beyond the jurisdiction of a court, but it's just unclear what that means, substitute or unreachable property. On page 2, line 25, it's unclear what this section 617.8 means when they are talking about the return is subject to state law. I'm not sure what state law they're referring to. Um, statutes governing ex parte attachments, that, that part is unclear. Uh, and just one last example, though I do have some others, is on page 4 of line 30. It indicates the, the prosecutor shall summarily return to an innocent owner claimant an interest in homestead property or motor vehicle of less than $10,000 in value. It's, I'm not sure how that will work. What if the state disputes that the person really is an innocent owner? What does summarily return mean? What if the property has evidentiary value in the case but is also claimed by an innocent owner? So those kinds of things I think can be taken care of in the subcommittee work or drafting work. Um, so, and I'm happy to provide my other comments that I had to anybody who's working on the bill. And that was all I had for you today. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions if I can. I'm not an expert in this area. Thank you. Are there questions for Justice Kennedy? Uh, no. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, Whitney McGuire, who was your obviously <coughs> expert? Um, that's uh, Attorney Lee McGrath, and we also have someone from Massachusetts who's a victim of forfeiture, Mr. Russ Caswell. Uh, all right. Why don't we call Mr. McGrath? We have a schedule of problems. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Lee McGrath. Um, <clears throat> I'm the Legislative Counsel for a public that? interest law firm called the Institute for Justice. It's headquartered in Arlington, Virginia. We are the nation's leading advocates for forfeiture reform. I live in Minnesota where I run that office as well as my work as a, 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 legis as a Legislative Counsel. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members, you are not the only state legislature considering a bill, but you are the one that is considering the best bill. Uh, this piece of legislation is far superior than what is being heard in the other states where I'm working, Arkansas, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Minnesota, uh, Wyoming, uh, Nevada, Montana, and, and elsewhere. It is the best because it is the most comprehensive uh, your predecessors have studied uh, this issue. It covers all areas of, of the law. It is succinct. It has been scrubbed and uh, it has been reduced to six and a half, pa six and a half pa uh, pages. And I looked at Representative Birch because that was his, uh, when we talked in the past, that was his advice and we, fo we followed uh, it. It is timely for you to consider this uh, legislation because the federal government is going to change its law. Today in New Hampshire the overwhelming majority of seizures by the police and forfeitures by prosecutors is done under federal law. But the, the notoriety of federal programs such as the adoption program and the equitable sharing has caused Attorney General uh, Holder to announce a change. It is a small change but it has ignited the interest of Senator Grassley, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and Senator Paul and Representative uh, Whit, uh, Whitberg, who have introduced the FAIR Act. And so today, most of your forfeiture is done under federal law. In the future, I suspect a good portion, uh, an increasing portion, will be done under state law. Your current state law is inadequate antiquated. It talks about things like a libel, which I had to look up as some sort of notice. It requires all sorts of cumbersome warrant require, uh, requirements. It does not address uh, many of the core issues that are at the heart of, of forfeiture. 
So I urge the committee uh, to embrace the comprehensiveness, yet the succinctness of Representative McGuire's bill. This bill is also pro-law enforcement. Seizures are not change, so the work of police officers on the street is unaffected by this bill. What is affected is the work of, pros uh, of prosecutors. And it, it is pro-law enforcement because it protects the reputation of police officers. We have seen from Boston to California police officers engaged in policing for profit, seizing for salaries. And this bill is a prophylactic that would prevent those type of things happening in, uh, in uh, New, New, Ham New Hampshire. <coughs> and it is something that you can live with. The people of Vermont, the people of Maine, have much better laws than what you have currently under state under New Hampshire's state forfeiture laws. In those two states, 100% of the seized assets go into the state's general fund. Yours does not do that. Your current law, state law, does not do that. This bill would remove the financial, the perverse financial incentives that uh, exist in most states, all but eight, and Vermont and Maine are two of those eight, and it, it, would, uh, it would elevate Vermont, elevate New Hampshire, to having the best forfeiture law in the country. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I'd welcome the opportunity to answer Representative Birch's question that he made to uh, ask of Representative McGuire. Actually, I have a slightly thing. Uh, Representative Birch, you know, as long as you're here and save you another trip from Minnesota. Um, and my question should not be interpreted to me now post in this bill. I'm not. I do have some questions about uh, portions of it. Uh, under the definition of law enforcement agency, and this really goes back to Representative McGuire's statement, uh, uh, Roman numeral six, it defines it as any non-federal police force, uh, which would look like include local county or state agencies and the like. My experience is that there's a lot of forfeiture done through joint uh, task forces that are both federal and state. Um, I'm trying to figure out how that would fit into your definition here under law enforcement agency. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative uh, Birch, this bill will just affect New Hampshire's law. Those sorts of collaborations that you speak of almost always end up being prosecuted, not only in New Hampshire, but elsewhere, under federal, federal law. And so the suspect is charged with federal crimes, and he is charged with federal forfeiture. That can continue, because this bill will not change any of that. What it will do is it will set up the procedures necessary, it will, ins it will once seized by New Hampshire police, it will set up procedures for the prosecution of the forf of the crime under New Hampshire law and under New Hampshire forfeiture law. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mr. Chairman, if I could just repre answer Representative Birch's yes. question that he re asked of, of Representative McGuire regarding seizures and holding, <coughs> holding uh, evidence. This bill explicitly allows for property to be held uh, on page 3, line 19, when it is needed for investigatory reasons. So in other words, to play out the hypothetical, if, if, uh, if I get stopped driving through uh, uh, Man Manchester, my car gets seized, and Mrs. McGrath wants to come into court and she, uh, and she attempts to uh, exercise her right under this motion, for, this motion for a quick hearing, she can try that. But if the car is needed for investigatory reasons, Mrs. McGrath has to wait. Just quickly, and that 
investigatory purposes answer is sufficient? Yes. It, it, we think that is, we are striking a, a, a balance. There are elements here that, that are, uh, in my perfect utopian world, I would not include one such as substitute of assets that the justice spoke, uh, spoke about in a perfect, <coughs> we would exclude that, but this is a balanced uh, piece of legis legislation that attempts to strike the right balance uh, between law enforcement's needs and the protection of the public and the due process rights. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you use it? <coughs> Excuse me. You use the term uh, uh, forfeiture for profit. Do you know of any of cases in New Hampshire where uh, that type of thing has happened or has allegedly happened? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hopper, uh, Holder, <laughs> I don't know of cases in, in New, New Hampshire, but I do know of cases in Massachusetts and in Minnesota and in New Mexico and in uh, Nevada. More specifically, though, I take note of the fact that under your state law, the split between law enforcement, the local and, and state, and, the, and, uh, help, uh, and drug rehabilitation pro prohibitions is 45, 45, 10. And the split when you do federal forfeitures is 80, 20. And I do know that almost all forfeiture in New Hampshire is done under the federal law. And I leave it to you to make the inference, and I will make the implication that one of the reasons why federal law has a near monopoly for seizures and forfeitures is because the mix of what goes to local law enforcement is different. Representative Horgan? Would this bill um, prevent, I guess, so that local law enforcement is getting a cut of the uh, federal forfeitures? Would this bill, um, would they be still getting that if this bill was passed as is? It would, Mr. Chairman, Representative. Uh, Horgan, they, they would. This bill only changes New Hampshire law. Now, having said that, there is the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, even John Oliver, the comedian on HBO, <coughs> has raised the level of awareness of forfeiture to the point where Chairman Grassley and uh, uh, others are going to address the very problem of, of, of state officials circumventing circumventing state law. So to your point, North Carolina has the best forfeiture law in the country right now, and very little is done under state law, and lots of it is done under federal law. This is a good first step to put New Hampshire's state forfeiture law as strong as it possibly can, as strong, even better than North Carolina's. Thank you very much for being with us. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. I have a card from Representative Cushing. Representative Cushing does not indicate that he wants to speak. Uh, he supports the bill. Uh, I have a card from uh, Dan Itzi. Representative Itzi, Washington Dan, supports the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee, for uh, hearing the bill. I am Representative Davis. I represent Rockingham County District 10, and I am in full support of this legislation. Um, I have to admit, I'm not familiar with the details. However, as an issue of fundamental justice, we ought not be allowing uh, non-convicted or even worse uh, innocent parties proven innocent to lose their property by civil asset forfeiture. That's just wrong. Um, there was a question as to issues, and I, it doesn't quite leap to the level of uh, policing for, or uh, seizing for profit or, or forfeiture for profit, but our county attorney, <coughs> unlike the county attorneys of every other uh, county in the state, who turn their asset forfeiture over to the county's budget, was keeping it within his own budget and creating, if you will, an off-budget budget. And that's due to the vagaries of our own statutes and 
while nothing he did was strictly illegal, it certainly rose to the level of icky. Because he would go on uh, uh, legitimately on uh, to conferences, uh, expenses on his expense report, and then pay back, pay off his those expenses to his personal uh, card out of the civil asset forfeiture. Illegal? No. Uncomfortable? Definitely. Um, I think it is high time that we tightened up and modernized our civil asset forfeiture laws. Representative, would you answer any questions? I will. I will take limited questions to the to the degree that I am confident to answer. Them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have a card from Lieutenant John Incarnacio. Close. Incarnacio. <laughs> New Hampshire Department of Safety, State Police. Yes. He has 20 copies of his comments and you of this. Mr. Chairman, I have for you probably more than 20 copies of the department's position paper. I also have a few other documents to hand out. This is the position paper. I have two copies, and this is for the committee to keep, of the uh, Guide to Equitable Sharing, the federal guide. And additionally, I have a number of copies of uh, just specifically what um, equitable sharing is, and what the, the funds can be used for by law enforcement. I will be brief. My name is John Canasio. I'm the commander of the New Hampshire State Police Narcotics and Investigations Unit. The Department of Safety is opposed to this bill. However, we do recommend further study. Uh, we realize that there are currently changes going on within the federal system and uh, those changes will obviously, they have already affected how we operate and going forward we're going to be looking more towards the state. Uh, I think uh, one of the other representatives said that the majority of uh, forfeitures are done federally and they certainly are by, by my unit and that's based on the type of investigations that we do. Um, there's no questions that in some parts of the country law enforcement has abused the process. I don't disagree with that at all. I've seen it. Uh, however, I have not seen it here in New Hampshire. Uh, I am unaware of any issues that have come up in New Hampshire regarding this, uh, especially to the degree of some of the um, problems that I've seen elsewhere. The fact at this point is that we don't know the full impact of this bill. It's lengthy and it's an extremely complex piece of legislation. It's obvious that the sponsors have put a lot of time and effort into it and we don't want it necessarily to die on the table. We would recommend that it be sent to study where a wide variety of stakeholders, including the courts, police, defense bar, and civil liberties advocates, could roll up their sleeves and participate and if something is to ultimately pass, it will be carefully researched and we will know exactly what the impact will be. And I will take any questions. I'll try to answer them. I know that there was a, a hearing earlier on civil forfeiture and there was uh, a lot of questions that went unanswered. Maybe I can answer some of those similar questions. Quiet <laughs> Very good. Thank you. And you will be happy to safely participate in the subcommittee work on this? Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a card from Russ Caswell, representing himself from the Pittsburgh, Massachusetts. Uh, you've asked for three to four minutes. Uh, we have a tremendous list of 
people that are going to speak on this. Uh, Hi, I'm Russ Caswell. I was a victim of these civil forfeiture laws, although I did win the case. And, uh, I'm here to try to help. That this won't happen to anybody else again. I'm definitely in support of this bill. Can I ask you to speak up for? Okay. Uh, I own a small motel I did in Tuxbury, Mass. And we've been there for uh, since the mid 50s, and we've never had any problem with anybody in town complaining to us about anything we should be doing different. The police say we cooperate with them, we give them rooms for surveillance if they want to watch somebody, uh, they have complete uh, access to our registration cards and everything else. They all testified that they have no problem with us or anybody at the motel. And uh, then one day I get the mail. And there's these two forfeiture notices in there. Well, let me go back a little bit. The town gives a permit to operate every year. And we get inspected by the fire department, police department, and all of that. And everything is fine. And then I get these notices, and with a lot of legal mumbo-jumbo, I guess you say, in it, they said, we're taking your property. And they listed these cases. They, at the time, they had about, I think it was about five cases, going back like 18 years. And most of these cases I never even knew existed. The police in our town, they have this policy of not telling anybody anything that doesn't have anything to do with uh, the police department. So if I see them in the ad, I go out and say, you know, what's going on? Whatever. They just, they won't tell you anything. I get out of the police station now and then, try to find out about something or what on. They tell you absolutely nothing. So we deposed like eight of the police who are involved in these cases, and every one of them, said the same thing like I just said, how we cooperate with them, they're happy to come down to the motel and chat with the people, everybody's very cordial there and all that kind of thing. And nobody stands in their way from checking out whatever they may want to look at or any questions uh, or anything. And so I'm sitting there and I, I felt like saying, well, what the heck are we doing here? This is just making no sense to me. Because they never accused me through the whole thing, the trial and everything else, or anybody else there, of anything. Now keep in mind the motel uh, was a prey or assessed at a million and a half and there's no mortgage on it. So like I say, we deposed all the police, none of them were against us at all. And then we deposed a DEA agent, a Vincent Kelly. And my, my lawyer asked him, because there's other properties right in that same area that have more drug problems than we do. There's a Motel 6 and there's a Home Depot parking lot, they have a lot of trouble up there and so on. So anyway, he uh, deposed uh, uh, asked this uh, Vincent Kelly, what makes you go after one property and, and not another? How do you pick properties to go after? And his answer, if you don't uh, hear anything else I say, listen to this. His answer was, we don't go after anybody's property unless the owner has at least $50,000 worth of equity in it. And they go to the registry of deeds and see who owns it and, and check <coughs> for that. So finally, I realized what this was all about. It's about stealing people's property. It had nothing to do with drugs because I was never accused, nobody there has ever accused of anything. <coughs> and it went to trial, and the whole trial was the same way. The police got up, said nothing, absolutely nothing against us. It was just bizarre. And the judge saw right through the, the whole thing. They just, they used these smoke and mirror tactics because they know people can't afford to fight this stuff. I had to spend a about $100,000 I had to take a loan out to defend myself with this thing and then the Institute for Justice came along and saw how ridiculous it was and uh, they volunteered to help me for nothing and we ended up at the end of it getting all our money back, I got my money back and, and they got paid. But the way they, they go after people is they know you can't afford it so they, they want to, with me they wanted a settlement. Well, uh, I call it more like an extortion plot really. Our re interest really is our bill, our <coughs> bill, not the New Hampshire law, or the Massachusetts law. Yeah, but I'm just telling you what this, these forfeiture laws... Do you understand that how would this terms and condition of our bill help you? That you'd have to talk with the lawyers about. I'm not familiar with that part. I'm just telling you what happened to me with these forfeiture laws when used by, I'd say, overzealous prosecutors and police departments can just steal from people. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for this witness? Representative Thank you. 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 Th
so you, your, your statement was that you weren't accused of anything, and yet they were able to seize your property? What, what was the reasoning for them being able to seize your they property? They had these, like I said, about, I think it was about eight cases of people that they arrested there over 18 years. They went way back to, into the early 90s somewhere. In most of these cases, I never even knew about. They never called me to court to testify about anybody or anything. And they're the ones that they're using them cases because that happened on that property. They don't have to accuse me or anybody else there of anything. It's just the fact that it happened there. And now they have this supposed innocent owner clause, which is good, I guess, but what they don't tell you is it costs you thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to even use the thing. So people just give up and do some kind of deal with them where they, they'll take so much money and then they'll leave you alone. That kind of thing. That, that, that's all it was. I know it's bizarre. I still have a hard time swallowing it, but, but that's what it was. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. Was the DEA agent ever charged with anything? No, not that I know. They can do this stuff legally, morally, it's just not there, but legally they can do it. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, James Burrow, New Hampshire Department of uh, Justice, is it? It is, thank you. Thank you. And you're opposed to the bill? The department is opposed to the bill, yes, sir. And you're going to tell us why? Yes, sir. Again, my name is James Vara. I am a Senior Assistant Attorney General at the New Hampshire Department of Justice. I have some um, documents I would like to hand out. I have 15, so hopefully that is enough. Uh, first of which <coughs> is the drug statute, drug forfeiture statute in New Hampshire, which is 318B, 17B. Um, I passed out both of the current statutes. Oh, 617 and then 318B, 17B. Well, I mean, I have 318B, 17-B, and 617-A personal property. Great, so I won't have to hand out that one, but um, I also have 318B-17C, which discusses the drug forfeiture fund of where the money would be deposited, or where it is deposited. I have 318B-17B. Do you have C as well? No. No. So if I, if I may? <coughs> Yes. Oh, you have that too? Yes. We do. And we have 17E and 17F. Right. So um, here are the, also the uh, Attorney General's Asset Forfeiture Manual as well. I you don't have this. No, no, no. We can read it. Yes. We certainly will provide a copy to anyone who wishes to have a copy. So we can be, right now. Sure. If there are any extra copies here, I, I brought my entire box of them that I had uh, sitting in my office. Can I just email you for one, or am I going to have to 918 it? I'll just, if we have a copy, I'll just give you a copy right now. Is that, yeah, that works? If there are any extra copies, I'll just give it to you. You, know? you will not have to 918. I'll just give you a copy. How about that? Well, there are not going to be enough copies. Well, I'm saying if there are, if they're not. I'll give you a copy. Go to 918. Public, I hope that it was on the website. My website but it's not. So. Thank you. So as I indicated, the New Hampshire Department of Justice opposes this bill. And the main uh, crux of the Department of Justice position is really related of what will happen with the funds. In New Hampshire right now, we had 200 80 plus deaths, opiate deaths, as of last year. Um, it will be more than that. We presume it will be over 300 opiate deaths in the state of New Hampshire. We have a, a heroin opiate epidemic in the state of New Hampshire right now. It's clear. And really how that then ties into the problem that we have here today. Other states, there may be problems with their, with their statutes. That's clear. And what I've read in the New York Times article, what I've read in the Union, Union Lear, what I've read in the Valley News, there's certainly problems with what other states have, have done and continue to do, presumably, with their forfeitures, which then precipitated the New Hampshire, the U.S. Department of Justice to change their, presumably change their ways in which they were doing forfeitures. Do we have a problem in New Hampshire? 
Uh, I would venture to guess that we don't. And the reason being why I would say that and why I'm, I'm firmly can say that is because I am the only person at the New Hampshire Department of Justice that handles all forfeiture cases in this state. There's only one person, and that's me. Last year, we did 31 forfeitures for a total of $58,000. So we handle a very small amount in terms of what forfeitures that our Department of Justice can handle and, and do, which are, are certainly outlined in that manual. The U.S. Department of Justice has handled traditionally anything over $2,000, so we handle $1,000 to $2,000 uh, forfeitures. Obviously now with the change with the U.S. Department of Justice, we will be handling, uh, presumably handling more of them. And I want to go through uh, 318B17B, and I want to talk about the protections that are, that are certainly there. Ultimately, it's not a determination uh, based on what I do. So here's how the process works, and I want to be, uh, the statute is long-winded, as all, as you will see, as all 318B is. Uh, that's the world in which I live in always, as I'm the Drug Prosecution Unit Chief. So I handle all Drug Prosecution Unit issues, including, uh, as I said, forfeitures. Uh, and there's only one of us, and that, and that, that is me. We have another. Uh, attorney as well, who will be starting up shortly once he is admitted. So here's how, here's how the process works under 318B17B. So a drug investigation is initiated, there's a search warrant obtained, and, and of course all things could be different, but this is traditionally how it is handled in the plus 50 or so forfeiture cases in which, in which I have handled. So a drug investigation is initiated, someone is there arrested, a search warrant is obtained, or um, their person is arrested. Um, a felony in, pro in progress, so they could take the, well, use, let's use money, because I think that's the safest and traditionally the, what traditionally does. <coughs> so the money will then be seized by the police department. In this case, we'll use the New Hampshire State Police, because Lieutenant Encarnacio is still here and he testified before. What will happen is this. It has to be a felony level offense before the New Hampshire Department of Justice will get involved. If at any point in time that charge is dismissed, if at any point in time that charge is reduced to a misdemeanor level offense, we at the Department of Justice file a motion. If a petition has been filed, we are no longer involved in it whatsoever. Why? Because the pay to play. Obviously, the concern that we, of course, have with any law enforcement agency, have I seen it? No. Could it, of course, happen? Yes. So we've taken the strong position, I feel, that if we see an agency reducing these cases to a misdemeanor level offense, and of which the forfeiture will then be provided to them, the concern, of course, is they did that to obtain the money, so we then no longer become involved in it. So what happens though before that? So a seven day letter is provided to uh, <coughs> the suspect, and that defendant at any point in time, he or she can, tact, can challenge it. So we have the seven day letter, the file is then provided to the New Hampshire Department of Justice, and answering a question that was asked before, we provide full discovery, meaning of what we are obtained from the police department, we provide that to the suspect. So we file a petition within 60 days pursuant to the statute. A petition is then filed at any point in time now. The defendant has an opportunity uh, to respond to it. So the defendant is given a copy of the petition. It's mailed to their residence. I'm sorry, it is served upon their residence or served upon uh, the person themselves if, if they're uh, available. They have an opportunity at this point to um, insinuate themselves in the process. Meaning, I don't make any determinations at this point. I cannot seize the money. I cannot put the money anywhere. It is all then now in the bailiwick of the court. So, the suspect can now file a um, response to that petition, and then what happens? Then we have a hearing within 90 days. Now, the hearing within 90 days, the court can make a plethora of determinations. One, the money can be forfeited to the state, the money cannot be forfeited to the state, and then we go through this, this third analysis, which is a proportionality analysis. And the court can get, then determine that based on the suspect's um, alleged behavior, the state is not entitled to any of it, all of it, or you know, some of it. So at no point in time, let's be clear, that, that the Department of Justice can simply, or any agency can take this money. It can't. It just does not happen that way. By our statute, by 318B, 17B. And they're only handled by the Department of Justice, as I indicated <coughs> earlier. This is not something that's handled by the county attorney's office at all. So there are many times where the county attorney's office will call, and they call, they call me. And they will ask the simple question of, we now have a defendant who's pleading guilty. We didn't do the forfeiture process, meaning we did not comply with 318B17B. What can we do? The response, uniformly, let me repeat, uniformly is that money has to go back to the defendant. Why? 
You did not follow the process. And as I indicated earlier, if the petition is not filed within 60 days, money has to go back. That's the, and again, I'm using money as, as, the, as the, it's traditionally what it is. Has to go back. And again, at no point in time does the money simply go into the coffers of the local agency. Certainly, obviously, after the petition is filed, the court makes a determination. We have to, we have to show by preponderance of evidence, we have certainly a burden of proof to show this, and then the money would be forfeited. So what happens then to the money when it's forfeited? So as indicated earlier, the money, again, I'm using money, 45% goes to the New Hampshire Department of Justice, which then could be used, and 10% goes to Health and Human Services, and then 45% goes to the agency. So let me talk about what that 45% to the agency. So I want to use the language specifically. The monies shall be used primarily, pri primarily for meeting expenses incurred by law enforcement agencies in connection with drug-related investigations. Drug-related investigations. This isn't something where it's being used to pay their salaries. This isn't something where they're splitting it up amongst themselves in some sort of nefarious way. That's where the money goes. And that's really the crux of at least the Department of Justice's position on this. Because what will happen with the money now if this uh, bill to, were to pass? And I do have some concerns about, about the bill itself and some constitutional issues with it as well. So if this bill were to pass, it goes all to the general fund, which in many ways may sound like a good thing to do. But here's what it, it would do to at least the New Hampshire um, Drug Task Force, which I am the attorney for the New Hampshire Drug Task Force, of which $500,000 each year go, comes from the general fund. Approximately $1. million comes from federal uh, JAG, Burn JAG grant, comes from that. And of which approximately, and this is, as I said, there was um, less than $60,000, which I handled last year. M most of it does come from the U.S. Department of Justice in which they handle the cases. $200,000 for, for the uh, fiscal year. Of it was, it's between one hundred and eighty and 200000 the last few years. I've been doing this, uh, at least in this capacity, as the head of the unit since uh, for approximately a little over two years. So what does that money go to? That money, can again, cannot go to paying any task force agent salaries. That money goes for equipment. It goes for vehicles to do Undercover, because obviously the New Hampshire Drug Task Force does unco undercover investigation. That's primarily what the task force does. So it goes for weaponry. It goes for these items, which are, which are entirely needed in the culture that we're living in today. The heroin epidemic, the opiate epidemic, is just one compor component of what we have going on in this state. It's a dangerous, dangerous environment. Certainly something before I was, before I had, I had this position, I was at the New Hampshire Department of Justice. I've been doing this about almost 10 years now, um, and in which I handled um, homicides and then the gamut of cases that they handle. And I was also at the county attorney's office in <coughs> Grafton as well. You have no, um, at least I had no perspective of how dangerous the problem is and it continues to be. And that's where the money goes to. It's again, not, what we see is other states have problems. What I have not seen is, is at least in New Hampshire, as it's related to drug forfeiture cases, the problems that many, many other states see. Because there is so many controls, there's so many processes that are in effect where the judge ultimately makes the determination. It's not something that's ultimately made by, by myself or any law enforcement agency. And we certainly, um, if this do, does go to a study committee, would, would, would really value um, being asked to be involved in it because we do have some concerns. And, and maybe there are certain changes that, that should be made. I'm, I'm certainly the Department of Justice believes that certain changes could be made and, and may be better uh, processed. But, how this currently reads, and I just want to touch on very, and I know I'm using my full five minutes, and I apologize for that, probably over that period of time. There is talk of, at least in paragraph, okay, in paragraph on page two, uh, Roman numeral two, nothing in this section <coughs> shall prevent property from being forfeited by plea agreement approved by the presiding criminal court or other agreements of the parties. Again, this is something that the Department of Justice has worked so hard for. For if there is a plea agreement amongst the parties, this has to go through the Department of Justice. It has to go through me. So if a county attorney's office has a case, has a drug case in which a forfeiture was made, the call comes to me. Can we resolve this case? A petition has already been filed. Because again, if a petition is not filed, you're, you're done. You're done. So 
now eliminating that process and allowing any office to handle this, because again, this, this proposed legislation, any county attorney's office can handle it, gets us into that concern later on where you know, perception becomes reality. And I think that's become a huge problem of where forfeitures have, have gone wrong. And many times reality is reality and there's certainly mistakes made. What we don't want to see is this question of impropriety made by any other office. So there's layers, and again, layers being the police department, county attorney's office when they're involved in the prosecution of the case, the Department of Justice, and then the court. And then I do want to just touch on just two final things. One being where it talks about $10,000 in value. The thought is, that it, can a forfeiture be made of over $10,000? Because there is no talk in this bill of anything over $10,000. And that is on page number four. It's referenced in Roman numeral three at the bottom of the page. So that's under 61717, innocent owner. And then it's referenced again. It might have been referenced before that. I apologize. On page um, number three, on 61714, trial proceedings, and then it's discussed again. So I do have a concern of that as well. <coughs> There's also a, um, a concern that I have about where it talks about if someone were to um, represent needs, uh, if, for, if it's money, can have the, the um, money given back to them for representation. So the concern would be someone is a drug dealer. Again, frankly, I, I don't deal with county attorney cases any longer. So I deal traditionally with large scale drug operations where someone may have 80, 90, $100,000, none of which they haven't worked in many years, so it's all drug-related money, and in many times there, we have our buy money, which is the money used to, to buy the drugs are actually on them. So um, you have a scenario here in this where that money would then go back to that person to hire representation, truly counters any sort of rational thought of having a drug dealer sell drugs and have money pay an attorney. And then uh, secondly, there's a hearing called the Nebbia hearing. There's a, a court case, which is Nebbia, which discusses where someone has to prove where that funding is from, because the court, of course, is concerned that that funding is coming from nefarious ways. So we have a hearing before if a person were to have bail, where that money is coming from. So could, could this money also be used for bail money? So that's the main concerns of the Department of Justice. I welcome any questions on this. Would you, um, in the next number of weeks or so, go through the bill and the amendment and indicate problem areas that you find, uh, areas that are not, and I would also say look to areas where it improves our current statute. But I, I think there are, look, in all candor, there are areas where I think it, it can, be, can be improved, 318B, 17B, it's a long one. Uh, Representative Horgan. Yes, um, and I get any you've covered this already. It's the last section of the bill, section five on page seven, eliminates um, 318, most of 318, 17, which is 17 C through 17 F, and then also eliminates two other statutes that I haven't looked at yet about well, property and county and person <coughs> 20. But do you, do you, so do you, uh, I mean, obviously you your reservations about it, but what is, are those things that are taken out, replicated, would then be replicated, or are they just? totally eliminated. They are, they're not replicated because again, according to their, they're, they're not replicated. Because before I could even seek a forfeiture, this is what, and let me tell you this too, there are cases that we look at at the department, look at, we look at, I look at them, and you know, we make a determination and go, we can't go forward, it was wrong. And then there are cases, obviously we go forward, but even before we can go forward on any of these cases, what we have to show that, and again, we'll, I'll use money, that, and this is on the first page of 318B, 17B, that, was used or intended for use in the procurement, manufacture, compounding, processing, concealment, trafficking, delivery, or distribution of a controlled drug and felonious violation of this chapter. So before a petition could even be filed, it has to start there. That is not replicated, certainly, in the current, in the current bill. Proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, this probably isn't the time to go through uh, this this bill in detail, but one thing you you talked about that I wanted to ask, and that is the use of uh, uh, potentially uh, forfeitable money, contraband money, whatever, uh, to pay for uh, a criminal defense lawyer. As a criminal defense lawyer, I always felt it was unethical 
for me to accept money if I knew it was uh, uh, the proceeds of a crime. And I'm wondering if you had uh, any opinion as to that. I've been on the I've been on the other side my entire frankly my almost my entire career. I was I was in, I did private practice work for two years, so almost ten years or twelve years. I look. Um, before any and all of this, and, and as, a, as a criminal defense attorney, you still uh, a member of the bar, I may ask. So, uh, I'm retired. Oh, okay. So, but you know, the concern, right, ultimately in the end is your law license. I have to tell you that that ultimately in the end is my greatest concern of any of this. So I would be doing this in some nefarious way, taking people's money and putting my law license and my family at jeopardy that I wouldn't be able to make a living. So would I have a concern? Would, I can't answer that question because I've simply been on the other side I was going to say too long, but I probably shouldn't say that, but I've been on this side a long time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your testimony and all your materials. I have a question on page 2, lines 34 through 36, on the receipt process. It says, when property is seized, a law enforcement officer shall give an itemized receipt to the person possessing the property or in the absence of any person, leave a receipt in the place where the property was found if reasonably possible. How do you work with that? And is there a permanent place to keep a copy of that receipt if you can't find a place to put it? Um, I'm not a law enforcement officer, so but what I can say is I know from just simple uh, obtaining discovery. Um, what happens with all property, and Lieutenant Encanacio certainly can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, essentially what happens is, so let's say property is then seized, that person is given a copy, and a search warrant is obtained, a person is given a copy of the return. And what a return simply is, it lists all the items that were seized during the search. What then happens then to the items next? So let's say it's drug evidence. I think drug evidence, that's the world that I live in, so I guess it's, it's the easiest for me to talk about. So what will happen is, so then um, the evidence will then be taken to the New Hampshire State Laboratory, and then it goes to the laboratory for testing. In New Hampshire State Police case, they keep it there. So let's say it's a task, New Hampshire uh, Drug Task Force case, it comes back to the evidence locker. It's now obtained and kept in Evans' locker with a sheet indicating what it is, when it was seen, seized, and a chain of custody. And simply what a chain of custody is, every person that's touched those drugs in between that period of time is listed on it. And, and the reason for that, the, for probably many reasons for that, the reason why it's important for me to have that is because you have to show to the court, if this matter were to go to trial, who touched that. Could someone have tampered with it? So it's kept in evidence, seal tape, and it's, you know, I, I, I can't open it, I can't touch, you know, frankly, I can't open it, look at it, do anything to it either, because I don't want to be in the chain. Are there any other questions? That's fine, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would appreciate your help from the subcommittee to work on it and come up with one good statute for the nature. Thank you, sir, I appreciate it. We also need five more copies of the Okay, I will, uh, okay, <laughs> I will have more made. Um, I have about 12 to 15 cars of individuals, as individuals, who are for this gift. Um, it has been my experience that uh, a great deal of the information you offer is personal, and we certainly will be sympathetic, but that will not help us move forward to evaluating the current law and the proposed law. Um, so, um, Mr. Vera. if you don't want to speak, oh, for the, for the, for the, for the. please be speaking, emphasize the terms and conditions of the bill and the amendment in relationship to the current law. I have. Uh, <coughs> Kerwin Cooper. Oh, that, that's Catherine Cooper from the NHACDL. I'm um, Jill with the ACLU. She told me she had to leave, but her organization in New Hampshire supports the bill in addition to her national organization. That's Catherine Cooper from the New Hampshire Association. New Hampshire, a New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers comes out and supports the bill. And I have uh, Giles with this and that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gilles Bissonnette with the American Civil Liberties Union of New Hampshire. I'm a staff attorney. I have, uh, I hate to bog down your files even further. I know that they're, they're quite filled, but I have written testimony from my organization. In addition to uh, two uh, news articles, one from the Washington Post and another 
from the New York Times chronicling, I think these, these made a lot of play when they were published last year, but chronicling, chronicling some of the abuses uh, with respect to civil asset forfeitures um, that have occurred uh, throughout the United States. I'm going to try to be very brief. Uh, there's one key point I want to make, and then I would like to address some of the points that I've heard from some of the other speakers. But just as the broad headline with respect to our organization, we are strongly in support of HB 636. This has been a, a carefully crafted product of a multi-year effort by members of, this, of the House, uh, especially members of this committee and other stakeholders, to reform New Hampshire's flawed civil asset forfeiture uh, system that, one, allows property to be taken from people who have never even been criminally charged. That is critical, and I think the committee should understand that, let alone actually been convicted. Number two, the system hurts, the current system hurts poor people uh, who have civil asset forfeiture petitions filed against them because they are not entitled to court appointed counsel in defending against such petitions. And number three, the current system under state law creates incentives for law enforcement to confiscate property. New Hampshire can and should be better. Um, the, one of the the, the points I want to make, and it's purely just as an educational matter, is to talk about the two-tiered system that we currently have in New Hampshire. So we have, obviously, the, the criminal courts, you're charged with a crime. If you're convicted, uh, you're either fined or you lose your liberty. But the system we're talking about with respect to civil asset forfeiture is entirely different. It is a civil process. It is not a criminal process. In a civil process, you are not, if you're poor, you're not entitled to a court-appointed attorney. The burden of proof is not beyond a reasonable doubt. It is by a preponderance of the evidence. Those are meaningful distinctions because under New Hampshire's current system, property can be seized on the basis that it has a nexus to criminal activity without you having been charged of a crime. So, you know, the state files a petition and you go through this civil process that is wholly divorced from a, a criminal proceeding uh, if the government wants to deprive you of your property through that mechanism. And that is why I think the current law in New Hampshire adversely impacts the poor. Innocent people with little means can easily be swept into the system faced with consequences of losing property, one, without the benefit of counsel, and two, having been charged with or convicted of a crime, uh, or, and even not having been charged or convicted of a crime, and three, without the due process protections normally afforded to those in criminal proceedings. And as the system currently operates, a victim's option for recourse against the state in a civil asset forfeiture proceeding is directly tied to their socioeconomic status because the victim must spend thousands of dollars, if they even have it, to hire an attorney. Um, and you know, one of, I know there was some testimony from the Attorney General's office about the nature and scope of RSA 318 B-17B, and I want to be absolutely clear, and I haven't read the, the man, I, I didn't even see until today the, the, for, the asset forfeiture manual of AG's office, I didn't know they had it actually, but when you look at that statute, uh, 318B-17B, and you look at some of the New Hampshire Supreme Court cases that have addressed it, they have been very clear that under that statute, by its plain language, it does not require that a criminal proceeding actually be brought. And in another case, from 1987, the court explained that it is devoid of any requirement to prove connection with a specific illegal transaction. And what the court was referencing there was a forfeiture provision in current law that allowed for the forfeiture of all monies, coin, currency, negotiable instruments, securities, etc., that are linked to controlled substances. And what the statute says is that when those are seized as part of a civil asset forfeiture proceeding, they are presumed to be forfeitable. That's current New Hampshire law. So maybe there are additional protections in that manual that I haven't seen, but I can just tell you, from the way the law currently operates, property can be taken and the government doesn't even need to file criminal charges against you. I think that is profoundly concerning. I think it, it, it creates, uh, certainly as a policy matter, some serious due process concerns that the ACLU has. Um, with respect to, and I know there was some testimony from the Department of Safety concerning uh, the federal equitable sharing program, maybe should, we should wait to see what the federal government does. No, there's no need to wait to see what the federal government does. How the federal government 
deals with equitable sharing and whether there were reforms that are going to be made through that process. That's a question for Eric Holder. That's not a question for this committee. What the question is for this committee is, is New Hampshire law sufficiently protective of due process rights? I would submit to the committee that the answer is no. Uh, this committee does not need to wait, and I credit the committee uh, for taking the time to, to fully process these concerns during this upcoming year as it has in uh, prior years. But I do not think there's any need to wait. Uh, I do think that current law isn't sufficient. Now, there has also been some testimony that, you know, gosh, there's really not a lot of evidence of abuse uh, in New Hampshire. Um, why wait for a new story, by the way? I mean, what we do know is that there's nothing in our state law that would prevent an abuse happening, like the types of abuses that we've heard about nationally, like the types of abuses we heard about today uh, from the gentleman who owned a hotel uh, in northern Massachusetts. Um, you know, this bill, again, at the end of the day, it's six pages, but really what it's about is if you want to take property under the notion that it is the, the product or result of criminal activity, you need to prove that a crime was committed in, uh, in court. And I think it really is uh, that, that simple. And one last point that I just want to make clear. Again, this would have no impact on monies raised through the federal equitable sharing program. This just has to do with state civil asset forfeiture. Um, you know, there was some testimony from the Attorney General's office that in, I believe, the last fiscal year, there were 31 cases with $58,000 seized. Well, you know, that's actually a pretty small amount of money. That doesn't sound to me like that's going to break the bank if we try to reform this process in order to comply with due process. So with that, uh, I'm happy to take your questions. I know that everyone's short on time, but thank you so much for, for hearing from us, because I, I do think this is a very important issue. Okay. Do you have a copy of the amendment as well as the bill? You know, I actually, I, I know I received it, and I brought it to my office, and I misplaced it, and I did not bring it with me. I so got another one. Um, my apologies. I've got another one. Thank you. Will you look through this bill? and the New Hampshire statutes and see where you agree or disagree as to changes that should be made. And the chairman of the subcommittee is going to be Representative Sylvia. Representative Sylvia, do you have a card? A card. <laughs> I, I, I have Mr. Sylvia's email address. I'd be happy. We, we, uh, we can be in touch is with each other. Is he your office? I'm sorry? Is he harassing you? No, no. <laughs> do you have it? Rep Representative Sylvia and I had a conversation yesterday. We could find each other. All right. And I would, of course, Mr. Chairman, happy to, happy to do that. I have been involved you know, in this uh, from the beginning, and I'd be happy to continue, of course. Yes, we would like to have this look through very seriously and come up with a good, <coughs> good statute that benefits the state as well as doesn't disadvantage the citizens. Any questions? There are here to be none. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how are you doing in the rest? Taking notes? Um, we have the rest of the cards are individuals. Um, and I would ask that uh, unless you know the terms and conditions of the bill and current statute, uh, if you have information that is personal, I would appreciate your just mentioning it very, very briefly. Uh, we would like to hear from you. Uh, of course, in saying that, I see that I have a card from Kevin Bloom, uh, New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Less than three minutes could be three Oh, seconds. absolutely. That'd be really quick. Um, I really don't have that much to say that I didn't say during the last session. And the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance has been involved with this legislation for the last two sessions. The first one, which was under Republican administration, sent a subcommittee, and it was voted 10 to 0 in a bipartisan vote. Then it be moved into further legislation, of course, that went into following election, where you had a Democratic administration. That was last session. Some of you here voted for the bill, and some of you did not. Um, it has been reworked several times. We're reworked again this time. Just a little bit of history. And, but now I'm going to get to the finish. And that is, we are the same thing every time. First of all, we have law enforcement say, 
we never do that. And if you made us not do it, then it would cost us a lot of money. <laughs> so there's a little bit of oopsie there, or a little bit of disconnect. And then somehow, somewhere during the testimony, somebody says, heroin drug dealers. Okay, we're not talking about that. This is, as um, Gilles from the NHCLU said, this is civil asset forfeiture. We're talking about just requiring that a crime be committed. By definition, if you have a drug dealer that's been busted, that's a criminal asset forfeiture. And that is another constant that we've had during testimony, is those two things are conflated <coughs> to try to confuse you. They shouldn't be. All we're saying is you need to be convicted of a crime to have your property taken from you. Thank you. Otherwise, it's just theft. And at the point of a gun, of course. So thanks very much. That's it. Thank you, Mr. If anyone has any. Thank you. I have a card from, I believe it's Daryl Perry. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Perry. You Good afternoon. I will be extremely quick. Uh, you support the bill. I do. You're from King, New Hampshire. Yes. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was another committee that heard a uh, had a hearing on a bill relative to civil asset forfeiture. And there was a question that was asked that no one seemed to know. So over the last two days, I did some research and found information on the Institute for Justice website uh, relative to exactly how much money is seized using asset forfeiture in New Hampshire. And according to the Institute for Justice website, that number is approximately $1 million per year. You heard the gentleman from, I believe it was the Department of Justice that said that his agency only processes $58,000 per year, which tells you that the other $942,000 approximately winds up going through the federal equitable sharing that might be going away in uh, the near future. And also the Institute for Justice gives every state a grade. The New Hampshire forfeiture laws currently have a D rating from IJ uh, and everything else that I want to say has already been said. So I'll answer any questions <coughs> if anybody has any. Uh, any Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dennis Corrigan. I live in Pittsfield, Pittsfield, New Hampshire, and I'm going to not take my full one minute here. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit of the legislative history of the bill and give you some information that might be useful. What I'm passing out now is the te public testimony of February 2012. It's a one-pager, two-sided. The second document is the um, uh, subcommittee report that came out of that. This was referred to in, in 2012 to the subcommittee. This is a copy of the subcommittee report. I will need one copy. I'll give it to the clerk. And it says here, something we've heard before, is that the subcommittee heard from the uh, Office of the Attorney General that there's approximately a million dollar in property lost each year to forfeiture. The 50,000 came through the New Hampshire state process and the remainder 950,000 through the federal process. So I'll hand that to the clerk in a second. Final thing is the um, uh, documentation of the uh, results of this work in 2012. It came out 3-0 from the subcommittee in favor to uh, legislate and 10-0 to uh, legislate from the full committee. Would you like to take any questions? Seeing none. Yes, there's um, something that hasn't come up here. There is a... Uh, uh, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Um, only one of the one of the witnesses has said the code of civil forfeiture because the restraining order caused all guns to be removed from the home. Is that something often? Well, I don't know. I wasn't here then. Um, that's. I just thought you might like to read. That's a very succinct summary of what people testified before, including uh, Madame Nadeau from the Superior Court. She's testified twice. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> uh, the next card I have is the support the bill. Jason Sobrans. Jason. 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 J
Uh, he had to leave. He said he'd send the committee. <coughs> um, Kirk and that's where the writing goes south. Uh, McNeil. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you, what your last name? McNeil. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I was never very good at penmanship. <laughs> and uh, you're from Derry, New Hampshire? I am. And you've asked for five minutes? I can probably get it done in a minute and a half. Excellent. Um, I'm here to speak to the committee uh, because the way the current law is set up, if you are a business or a property owner, it potentially puts you in an adversarial relationship with the police if they're investigating a crime. For instance, if I have, I have a small wood shop in Derry and I'm opening a brewery here in Concord. If I have an employee who is selling drugs or using drugs at my business, under current law, I run the risk of forfeiting those assets under civil asset forfeiture. However, if we passed HB uh, 636, then it puts me in a position where I can be a friend with law enforcement without worrying about <coughs> losing my business or losing the assets of my business simply because somebody who happened to be on my property was violating the law. And I think as we look at the national news and we look at uh, cases across the country that we're in a situation where it would be beneficial if people who were property owners and business owners could be in a, uh, a non-adversarial relationship with law enforcement. And the way that asset forfeiture is set up today, it, it puts people in a quandary where they have to protect their assets and protect their businesses, and they may keep their mouth shut under those circumstances. So I view this bill as something that helps small business owners or larger business owners, and uh, for that reason, I support the bill. Thank you. Will you answer any questions? Absolutely. Any questions? There appear to be none. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I have a card from Jesse Edwards. Yes, sir. That's me. Uh, I, I've heard your request to keep it short. I'll keep it short. And you support the bill? I, I do, sir. Uh, I, <clears throat> I'm a citizen of uh, Auburn, Rockingham Ford. Um, I, uh, uh, served in the uh, Army for 33 years, did a combat tour, uh, swore an oath to the Constitution. I'm not a lawyer, um, but I, I understand our, our history, why we have a Fourth Amendment. And I would just like to uh, apologize to the committee because when civil asset forfeiture first came on board under the Reagan administration, I thought it was a great idea because drug cartels were scary and had a lot of money and they could buy government. So I thought this is necessary to protect and preserve our constitutional form of government. So like almost anything, once the camel gets its nose under the tent, uh, uh, an abusive situation can form. Uh, I, I think the law is currently constructed. Certainly it does open up the door to, to abuse. Uh, we have some basic principles. All of us are innocent until proven guilty. The burden of proof is on the government. So whether the, the current law uh, is uh, wise or not, whether the judiciary considers this there to be appropriate due process or not, or whether this is used very little or not, uh, this is a state power that violates our common understanding of just power, and I think uh, is um, uh, it, uh, it's out of sync with what um, the governed uh, offers their consent. To, to have done uh, in our names. So that's it. And I will take questions if there are any. <laughs> there are any questions? Thank you very much for coming. Sir. All right. I had an Adam Van Landingham. <laughs> Van Landingham. Uh, close enough. I'm <coughs> or two. <laughs> that's all right. Thank you. Welcome. You uh, support the bill. You asked to have one minute. Um, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a small business owner, general contractor, carpenter, an HVAC repair company. <laughs> this is what I own. If I, I have employees, and if one of my employees is doing something inappropriate at a, at a lunch break, then uh, the way the bill's written, I stand to be vulnerable and, and lose my work van and my tools, which is my livelihood. 
and uh, and I have nobody to represent me in that. You know, that's between the suspect and the prosecutor. So I support the bill. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Jason Sobrums, not back. I guess he had to leave. Yeah. Uh, Joseph Haas, um, supports the bill. He has written testimony. Um, I'll give you a copy. Pardon? I'll give you a copy of my email that I sent all the way All right, so uh, six minutes. Six. If you uh, would indicate uh, how you feel the Mr. Haas, would you indicate the relationship of the current law to the new bill? Well, I, I'll even go even further than that. I'll make a comparison between uh, both the current and the proposed and go to the Constitution itself. Because in this bill, it says somehow that the judge is allowed to deal with matters under $10,000, and that's in direct violation of the New Hampshire Constitution, Article uh, 20, I think it is, if the person claims a right to a trial by jury of anything involving $1,500 or more. This bill is good to prevent, but I, that is a lousy section that I want to take it out. And I, and I just have uh, uh, some comments that I made here. I'll, I'll do most of my comments by writing, but uh, just uh, as an example, on the Ed Brown case, that was a federal case, but uh, her uh, case was started out as the Department of Revenue, uh, it wasn't really a, a criminal case other than she wasn't paying the taxes on her business to the, the state. So actually it's like theft. Maybe it is a, a, a criminal case because she didn't pay it. But she would have to have that civil trial first before the forfeiture. And what happened was that they, the feds came in, well I don't want to get involved with the tax, but I'm just saying that the feds, because of that case was so screwed up, and also the, sits, the city and the town didn't do their taxing to the proper authority, meaning the occupant of the property, once they seized it, that they have a PALS, a, a uh, professional asset liquidation service that works with, that is uh, getting involved because the locals can't uh, do it. So I, I thought your committee would be, uh, would maybe like to talk with them on how they encountered uh, their badness in the past and is going to correct it. And, and I'm here as a la former landlord, so of course, uh, you know, if I uh, buy another property, I don't want uh, that to uh, happen, you know? Would you answer any questions? Sure. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have no other pink cards, so I will close the hearing House Bill 636. Yes. As I indicated, um, I am going to have a subcommittee, but it is must be the decision of the committee as to whether this bill will be retained. Um, so, um, do I have a motion to retain the bill? Mr. Chairman. Yes. I have a motion to retain this bill. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll Clarity. second that. Right. All those in favor of retention, raise your right hand or left hand. If you hate me, opposed. Uh, I'm going to appoint Representative Sylvia as the chair. Are you agreeable to that? This, I love is, this is going to be a, a really, it would be good to have the current law and the new law, everything sorted out so that we can pass it this time. Uh, members of the committee will be Mr. Representative Birch, who is glaring at me. Well, you is that a question, question or is that a, well, Are you willing to be on the subcommittee? Uh, you have a great deal of expertise in here in terms of... I am aware of that. Uh, <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, And who would like to be on the committee? Uh, well, we can. 
Representative Ruhr keeps raising her hand. I will take it if nobody else will take it. What does that mean? That means I'm happy to do it. Uh, Rulard and uh, Representative Wall, did you say you wanted to be on it? Well, only because there's some past history, but if someone else wants it, they're welcome to. Representative, Representative Woodbury would love it. Uh, I don't want to have, right now, there's one, two, three Republicans and one Democrat. It would be nice to have another Representative Wheeler. Which means to have a quorum, you have to have three. Of course, if there's only three of you, you only have to have two. <laughs> but I've only counted four. Who was? Uh,